On this edition of Native Report, we visit the Sagui Cultural Center of the Oneida Nation of New York. We meet Alf Jacques, a world-renowned traditional lacrosse stick craftsman. And we interview noted historian, writer, and curator Rick Hill. We also learn something new about healthy living and hear from our elders on this edition of Native Report. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Midwakanton Sioux Community, the Blandon Foundation, and the Duluth Superior Area Community Foundation. Welcome to Native Report. I'm Rita Aspinwall. And I'm Ernie Stevens. Inside the Sagui Cultural Center can be found marvelous testaments to the rich culture and proud heritage of the Oneida Nation of New York. Join us now as we explore the artifacts and artwork that link age-old customs of the past with the present and document how a nation has endured over the centuries. Inside this beautiful log structure can be found spectacular examples of traditional clothing and crafts that link age-old customs with who the Oneida are today. This is Sagoe Cultural Center. Sagoe means he gives, and that was the Indian name of one of our representatives, Richard Christian. He did serve alongside Ray Halberter, who is our current representative. Uh, for quite a few years in the 70s, 80s, and early 90s. He was an excellent wood carver. So when we built this cabin, it was only appropriate that we name it after him, and that is why it's called the Sagoe Cultural Center. This is a very comfortable building. You know, white pine is what it's made out of, and that is known as the Tree of Peace, because they buried their weapons underneath a white pine tree when the five nations joined together back in the day. A lot of the stuff in our museum is not specifically Oneida um, or Seneca or Onondaga. Um, it is really just kind of Haudenosaunee because we all shared the same kind of culture. We also have an exhibit that is on permanent loan from the New York State Museum at Albany. It's called Oneida Industries. So we have full-size mannequins doing activities they would have done prior or after contact with non-Indian people, so after being placed on reservations. So the people upstairs are actually doing activities to make money. Leather work, woodwork, whatever, just to make some type of craft to take to a tourist and sell it. We have a hands-on table here for kids and they can come and actually pick up a, you know, some sweet grass and some sage and smell it or an actual snow snake or um, those kinds of items just so they can actually touch things. I get to learn stuff every day. I get to teach things every day. I get to make sure that our people are learning what they should be learning. Exhibits on the sport of lacrosse and the one on basketry showcase the rich cultural and very important traditions of the Oneida Nation. This is a display that we did to show the different steps in making a stick. Um, sticks are traditionally made from hickory. And so the first thing you would do is find a, a nice straight hickory tree and you would go ahead and cut it into different pieces so you would end up the piece like this. And then you would go ahead and um, you steam it so that it gets nice and wet and hot. And then you would bend it. After it's bent, they have an, a special tool that you bend it with. After it's bent, it has to sit and dry and stuff like that. And so then the next stage would be this stick and then, of course, you would start shaving this off and making it smooth, and eventually it would probably not get to be this small, but it would eventually get to be this shape and this smoothness. This display over here is a weaving station, and this is to give the kids a chance to try to do some weaving on a stick. And then, of course, we have little buttons on our exhibit here that you can and it will tell you different words. So this one says lacrosse stick. Galase, 
So the kids can learn how to say acrostic or lacrosse. And so these are the various stages of the sticks. This is the basket room, and this is where we keep all of our, our baskets full. We have more than this in another building, but this is really kind of a select group of baskets. What we have here are the potato stamp style baskets for the Oneida Nation. So when you see this style of basket with these stampings on it, this is specifically Oneida. There is no other nation that made these. In this case here, we have some you know, examples of some traditional baskets regular square basket or round basket with a top. But these baskets did transition over into being what we have here. Very decorative. This room I love. Sagoe Cultural Center is relatively small and averages 50 visitors per week during the summer months. But on any given day, there may be a class offered to United Nation members or a special activity that the larger community may take part in. We had a generation of people who were not allowed to learn their culture, uh, who were not allowed to speak their language. And so we have a generation of elders right now who are in their 70s who know nothing about their culture. And that's not their fault. You know, we can't judge them or blame them. But we can certainly provide the resources now for our people to learn these things. That's why it's important that we teach it. That's my hope, just to make sure that the stuff is still here and that we're still, still learning it, still using it. Everything we do here is to ensure that we have a successful people seven generations from now. I'm Dr. Arnie Vineo, and today we'll be talking about hemoglobin A1C. This is important for anyone with diabetes or at risk of developing diabetes. Diabetes risk factors include family members with the disease, obesity, prediabetes, and gestational diabetes, which is diabetes during pregnancy. I'm kind of a science guy, and this is the science behind your A1C number. Red blood cells carry oxygen in our blood, and if we remember from an earlier segment, a teaspoon of blood has about 25 million red blood cells. Hemoglobin is an iron-containing molecule that binds oxygen in our lungs and carries it to the tissues that need it. Each red blood cell contains about 250 million hemoglobin molecules, and each hemoglobin molecule is made up of two alpha chains and two beta chains. A single hemoglobin molecule can bind four oxygen molecules, and that means a single red blood cell can bind a billion oxygen molecules. Hemoglobin A is the most common type and is the A in hemoglobin A1C. On the beta chain is the site that binds to a glucose or sugar molecule. Once that glucose binds to the hemoglobin chain, it never comes off. The higher the blood sugar, the more chances glucose has of binding and sticking, and we can measure the percentage of that bound glucose. In someone without diabetes, this is 6.5% or less. A hemoglobin A1C of 6.5 or over is the threshold for diabetes. A red blood cell has a lifespan of about 120 days, so we can use the hemoglobin A1C to go back about three months to estimate the average blood glucose. So a glass of orange juice or some other indiscretion on the way into the clinic won't change your hemoglobin A1C. Keeping your hemoglobin A1C in the normal range is the best way to avoid the complications of diabetes, like heart disease, strokes, kidney disease, vision loss, kidney failure, sores that won't heal, nerve problems, and amputation. A hemoglobin A1C in the 7 to 8 range is a problem, and any time it goes over 10, it means things are totally out of control. The highest we can measure is 14.0 in our clinic. When my brother had a stroke a few years prior to his death at age 53, his hemoglobin A1C was 13.6. There are many good diabetes medicines, but few are better than weight loss, exercise, and a sensible diet. If someone could make a medicine that could bring the hemoglobin A1C down a full number, they could sit on a beach with a little umbrella sticking out of their glass of orange juice for the rest of their lives. Diet and exercise can easily bring the A1C down by that much. Did you think I was going to leave out non-traditional tobacco use? Not this time. Diabetes damages blood vessels in the body, and this is where the complications of diabetes arise. All tissues depend on good blood flow, and damaged blood vessels don't carry oxygen well. This leads to nerve damage and poor healing. Nicotine affects blood flow and blood vessels and makes those problems worse. The best time to quit smoking was 20 years ago. 
The second best time is now. Do that for your children and your grandchildren. They need you. Don't forget to call an elder. They've been waiting for your call. I'm Dr. Arnie Huineo, and this is Health Matters. There's an art to making wooden lacrosse sticks by hand, and the most highly sought after ones are those made by master stick maker Elf Jacques. Join us now as we visit his workshop on the Onondaga Nation. On a warm late summer day such as today, Elf Jacques can often be found outside of his workshop working on one of his legendary wooden lacrosse sticks. But on this morning, He's preparing a stick-making demonstration for a group of visitors. Uh, I'm a stick maker here at Onondaga. I've always, since I was a child, my eyes were drawn to a stick standing in the corner, my father's stick. Anybody else, as you go to somebody's house and there's a lacrosse stick there hanging on a wall or in a corner. We teach our kids from five years old all the way up, and a lot of kids, they're given a wooden stick when they're very young, so they start with the wood the babies, to keep our culture, our way, all our way, you have to have wooden sticks. It's part of the religion. This lacrosse game itself is part of our religion. It's part of who we are as a people. And, uh, you know, I knew years ago, we need our stick to do what we have to do for the ceremonies, to be buried with, etc. And I figured that's my job to, to produce those sticks for the people. The visitors on this day are a group of referees who are officiating games at the World Indoor Lacrosse Championship. Elf demonstrates how he fashions his world-renowned lacrosse sticks. I was about 12 years old, 13, playing lacrosse here with the boys on the res, and I didn't have a stick. My father says, hey, what the heck, let's make our own. So I went right down here in the woods, cut down a, a tree, hickory tree, split it in pieces and started making lacrosse sticks. Nobody taught us how to make lacrosse sticks and so we were self-taught, okay? Uh, people just wouldn't teach and show you how. It was kind of like a closed society of the people who actually made sticks. They didn't teach people. It was through trial and error, Alf and his father perfected their technique. At one point, they made upwards of 12,000 sticks in a calendar year but now it's only Alf and his apprentice who make less than 500. My apprentice is a longhouse person. He's a very traditional man. He wants to learn this, everything about it, the traditional parts of it, everything about it, to get it all right. He's, he's the right one to do this because I'm teaching him everything. He's here. Other people can come, like uh, a Mohawk guy come down from up north, I teach him how, I'll give him a couple of days of training, two or three days training, he'll come back again for another session or two. And, and I tell people, you know, I can show you this, but you're gonna learn when you go home and do it yourself. Traditionally, I like hickory, and I use shag bark hickory. Hickory is uh, sort of like a, a sacred tree, you know, like the maple is sacred and the hickory is a strong, good material. Um, you would use it for tools, uh, for weaponry, um, and for lacrosse sticks. I'm keeping my sticks traditional by making my own rawhide for the wall, you build up the wall. Some people use nylon cord and put resin on it to harden it, and a lot of people do that. Um, they don't want to do the work. They don't want to clean a, a cow hide with a knife clean the hide, sit down, yeah. cut it, and all that. It's a lot of work. Elf, who was a goalie in his lacrosse playing days, also makes sticks representative of what other tribes used in their own versions of the game. His workshop contains all kinds of sticks and various degrees of completion. I make uh, box lacrosse sticks, mostly, because they use them. They use them in Canada and New York State and probably in Wisconsin for the box lacrosse game that we all know and love. I make box lacrosse goalie sticks because that's one place where the uh, wooden stick is actually maintaining in, in box goalie, not so much in field lacrosse, but box. And I make replicas, the old fashioned, the long net. I make replicas of that. 
I make uh, Ojibwe Menominee style and some Southeastern style. A friend of mine was out there and he played the game with them out there and he brought one back. They gave him one. And so the guy gave it to me and I copied it just like they had made it. This must be Choctaw? This is Choctaw. Yeah. They <laughs> beat each other up. They're always fighting, you know. They're yeah. hardly running with the ball. They're always fighting. Well, kinda... and the guys that pick up the ball, and they'll be running around people like this. Yeah. Because if you pick it up, you get oh. chopped in the head. <laughs> so in a crowd, you know, you carry it down here, yeah. so you'll get chopped in the head. I guess that matters to some people. There are coaches and there are players who want to get back to the roots of things to teach their players where the game came from. And it's not just the Iroquois game. Now the Iroquois game is what developed into what we play all over the world today, right? That's the Iroquois game. But then people don't know that there was Choctaw, Cherokee, Menominee, uh, Miccosukee, Seminole, Creek. They don't know about the other tribes that had their game, the two stick game, the one stick game in the Great Lakes. This one is Northern Minnesota Ojibwe. And people want to know that. When they see this, their kind of eyes just open up. It's like, wow, really? You know, I thought it was just this. Well, no, it's bigger than that. It's bigger than that with a whole lot more people, a lot more tribes over a bigger area. And the fact that religious ceremony is part of the play of all these different tribes who do that that changes it from a war game, the little brother of war, whatever you want, a violent um, <laughs> Stone Age people beating each other with a stick. It isn't all like that. And it opens people's eyes and they realize it's a lot more. And they kind of feel it when they're playing, that it is more than just a game. I hold the title of Turtle Clan Mother here at Onondaga. I've held it a long time. And in my clan, um, let's see, the, the duties of a clan mother are to help keep peace within the clan, also to help people learn about our culture, and also to, uh, if it's necessary, to find a chief to fulfill the, the next, the chief's title if someone passes away. And in our way, that makes sense. It makes a great deal of sense. It's, it's been this way for a very long time. And, and when you think about it, it's the women who watch the men grow up. It's the women who see what they're about. To see how, if they have compassion, if they're helpful, or what, their, uh, what their gifts are. Are they you know, good with math? Are they good with uh, communication? Are they mediators, natural mediators? And when you have that opportunity to go find someone, that you look for those gifts to serve the people. While lacrosse teams from around the world played inside the Onondaga Arena, a symposium next door revisited the basic call to consciousness which critiqued Western culture and asserted the basic human rights of indigenous people. The wampum belts of the Northeast nations play important roles in this concept of consciousness. Person. Holding a symposium dedicated to the issues of peace, equity, and friendship while the World Indoor Lacrosse Championship games are being played right next door seems quite fitting since the game is also known as the medicine game. Furthermore, both events are taking place at the Onondaga Nation, the birthplace of lacrosse, and the traditional Haudenosaunee governing principle known as the Great Law of Peace. This conference revisits what is known as the basic call to consciousness. When we were planning this conference, we were trying to come up with a theme. So I suggested uh, revisiting the basic call to consciousness. It was a book that came out, I think, in 1978. So I thought, well, let's revisit that. Let's see what it was about. Let's talk about uh, our new consciousness as a result of what's happened over the last uh, 30 years or so. So for me, coming to a cultural consciousness, a political consciousness, uh, is very important. 
be able to comprehend the meaning of things like the wampum belts or treaties or anything. Rick took part in a group presentation that addressed what has been achieved since the first basic call to consciousness and what still needs to be done to ensure that peace, equity, and friendship endure for many generations to come. To get this point across, he discussed the importance of the wampum belts. So wampum is very important, not only to the Haudenosaunee, but most of the natives in the Northeast. It was used by the Dutch, uh, the French, and the English to make agreements with their people. And the wampum belts are made from clamshells, and they're apparently purple and white color. This one here is probably the most interesting because it's probably the first treaty made between the native people. They call it the dish with one spoon. The, the dark figure represents a dish, and in the middle of the dish is a beaver tail. We're all supposed to share a meal from that same dish. So the whole idea is that nobody owns the land, nobody owns the animals, nobody owns the trees. It was given to all of us as not only a form of sustenance, but a way to cooperate and share. So that's a very important model, I think, for us today. Because sometimes we get a, in our minds, it's a battle between native groups. Whose land is it? Who's the first one there? Who, who uh, should have fishing rights? What, what our tradition teaches us is that these belong to all of us, but we're supposed to follow a protocol. We only take from the dish what we need to sustain our families. You always leave something in the dish for other people, and then you keep the dish clean. You don't want to be uh, getting your food from a dirty place. So the dish with one spoon wampum is very important to our people because it's our environmental ethic. And I think the best way to look at a wampum belt, it's almost like a cultural tape recorder. It captures the words, the memory of our ancestors, the agreements are made, very explicit detail, and, the, and it becomes locked into the belt. Subsequent generations pick up the belt, they're able to hear what the story is. This particular belt is called the Silver Covenant Chain of Peace. It's an agreement between Great Britain and the Haudenosaunee. On this side over here, the purple figure would represent the crown, that time the king, or today the queen. This figure represents our leaders on this side. They're holding a wampum belt, a symbolic wampum belt that goes all the way across the Atlantic Ocean over to their fire over there. When they want our attention, they would shake the chain and we would have a meeting. When we wanted their attention, we'd shake the chain. Sometimes we had to take, shake the chain a couple times to get their attention, but that was the idea of the covenant. They wouldn't let anything cause such harm, it was destroy the relationship. So in order to maintain it, they called it polishing the chain, making it bright again, like a silver when you shine it. That means removing all causes of harm, all potential dangers, so that our people can live in peace on both sides. So it's a very important historic document. This goes to the founding of uh, North America. We made a covenant chain with the French, uh, with the Dutch, with the English, with the Americans. So it's a very important political document as well. But the past is not the past, and these belts are as relevant today as they were centuries ago, or even decades ago, when the Haudenosaunee delivered the basic call to consciousness. So in 1977, when the Haudenosaunee, along with other native uh, delegates, went over to Geneva, Switzerland, to give testimony about the state of uh, native nations, they gathered together and uh, they took this uh, replica of this wampum belt, represents the two row wampum. This is our founding treaty. This dates back to about 1613 with the Dutch. So imagine there's two vessels floating in a river. One is a canoe and the other is a ship. And really it's a symbolic metaphor for how we're supposed to relate to one another. We're traveling in the same direction. It's all on the sacred river of life. And so we're meant to be uh, partners. We're meant to be allies on that. So our canoe is joined together with their vessel by treaty. We also said we're not going to try to steer each other's vessel, that we will respect each other's sovereignty. But we also realize the integrity of the canoe and the integrity of the ship have to be maintained by the people in it. So this two-row treaty, our wampum, is very important because it symbolizes the foundation of our relationship. Today you could say, here's the Haudenosaunee, here's the United States. Uh, here's the, uh, the Haudenosaunee, here's the United Kingdom. We still have this relationship between our vessels which represent our government, our belief system, and all of those things. So the treaty is the nature of the relationship between these two parties. It's not just the single pieces of paper where uh, words were scratched out, they're usually in French or uh, English, but it says that no matter what comes, we're going to work very hard to maintain that relationship. So as a result of this, we were able to survive uh, disease, famine, war, uh, many kinds of things that normally push people apart, but through the two row and through the covenant chain, we were able to bring it back together. And all the two row says, we're going to use principles, peacefulness, uh, respectfulness. So we're going to really find a way to honor what our ancestors did by remaking it today. In coming to consciousness, you really have to reflect on yourself. Our culture is really in the action of doing it. So thinking about it, but it's in the action. 
And many times we have to change the course of our actions because we get distracted, you know, we go to school and we begin to think that's what you're supposed to do. Or... So I think it's about taking personal responsibility for your conduct, for your thinking. At the same time, we're lucky, our generation, a whole bunch of elders we could talk to. Now, many of those elders have passed away, so we represent the generation that's to translate the thought of elders into a way that our young people can understand it. And you're giving it to people in a way that hopefully will help their lives be, be, become better. For more information about Native Report or the stories we've covered, look for us on the web at nativereport.org, on Facebook, and on Twitter. Thank you for spending this time with your friends and neighbors in Indian Country. I'm Rita Aspinwall. And I'm Ernie Stevens. Join us next time for another Native Report. Rita Aspinwall is an enrolled member of the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa and is an ICWA social worker with Fond du Lac Social Services. Ernie Stevens is a member of the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin and is a film and television producer. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Midwakanton Sioux Community, the Blandin Foundation, and the Duluth Superior Area Community Foundation. <laughs>